Thank you, Tony, and thank you to the Institute for having me again. Uh, also, thanks to Valerie for arranging uh, uh, everything uh, in my visit here in Dublin. Um, I'll try to be brief. What I want to try to do is give, give an overview of the situation as it stands now in Bosnia, uh, why we are where we are, and what could conceivably be done to, to turn it around. Um, uh, and I'd be happy to talk about the Diplomats Handbook in the Q&A. At the other point, that's not why I came, but it was, it's, uh, I know there might be an interest in that. Um, very, very briefly, I mean, we, assumptions are very important in, in determining policy, and I think that the, part of the reason we are where, where we are now in Bosnia are the assumptions that the policymakers had in 2005 uh, at the tail end of Patty Ashdown's tenure as high representative. Uh, the assumptions at that point uh, which was at the sort of pinnacle, in retrospect, the apogee of, of the state-building process in Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, were that it had been very successful. There, had been, there were a few bits of unfinished business, like police reform, to get done. But the assumption was that uh, the international community could throttle back its engagement in Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, away from the executive roles that it attended uh, Dayton implementation and efforts to build the state for, for functionality's purpose, first and foremost, but to, to allow for Euro-Atlantic integration. And that Bosnia would be able to move forward under its own power toward European, European Union membership and NATO membership. Uh, those assumptions were fundamentally flawed at the time, but they were very easy to make and they were very widely held. Um, and, uh, but they started to be proven wrong immediately in the following year. Uh, we're in an election cycle right now, four-year election cycles. There's a general election on October 3rd. There was a general election in October 2006. Um, in 2006, three, three events uh, came together in rapid succession uh, that started the downward spiral. Um, that we're in now. Uh, two happened almost exactly simultaneously. The first was the decision by the international community to choose a successor to Patty Ashton, who was going to be a closer to, uh, to close down the office of the high representative, to shift to, or transition is the term of art, to an all EU led presence. Uh, this was before Lisbon, so a, a strengthened European Union special representative, which is the other hat the high representative wears. Um, and this was Christian Schwarzschilling from Germany. Um, uh, the fact that we could get into this in the, in the discussion, the selection process for these officials, I think, could use a lot of work. Uh, uh, I think you'd probably get a better talent pool if you put an ad in the back of The Economist, particularly given, given the, co the, the, the paycheck that goes along with this job. But, uh, but in any event, uh, his, he came in with an assumption that he was going to not use his executive authorities <coughs> unless it was going to involve uh, cooperation with the Hague Tribunal or threats to the Dayton order. But that's a very big eye of the beholder basket. Um, what happened also simultaneously, this was the beginning of February 2006, uh, also beginning of February 2006, Milorad Dodik, uh, the Prime Minister of Republika <coughs> Srpska, one of two entities in Bosnia-Herzegovina, became Prime Minister. He was able to assemble a coalition before the elections and run, in essence, as an incumbent uh, with all the, the powers accruing to the entity government. Uh, in the elections. At this point, the cooperation with the Republika, between the Republika Srpska uh, and the international community and the state in, in, in building state institutions pretty much stopped dead in the water, almost to the day. Um, then in April, the failure of a constitutional reform package, which has subsequently become known as the April package of constitutional reforms happened. This had been initiated in, as a, uh, a non-governmental effort at first, uh, a collaboration between the US Institute of Peace, where, full disclosure, I used to work as a, a Balkan policy analyst in 2000, 2001, and the Dayton Peace Accords Project. Um, 
somewhere it, it, this had, this had involved eight political parties in Bosnia Herzegovina, and it was it was at the senior working level, so below the leadership level, but at the top of each party, to try to come up with a series of reforms that could meet the the standards that were set forth by the Venice Commission in their report earlier that year. Uh, to allow for constitutional changes that would uh, let Bosnia move forward toward, toward European Union membership. Um, in, late, in late fall, this essentially got hijacked by the United States government, which, which wanted a, a, a deliverable, a trophy for the 10th anniversary of Dayton. You know, we've done our bit over to you, Europe, over to you, Bosnia. Um, I, it was also a race against the clock because constitutional am amendments had to happen in time for the election law to be amended so these constitutional changes could be reflected in the election that was coming up in October 2006. Um, what you had was, uh, was, was a real push at the end and you also had Haris Selajic, the head of the party for Bosnia-Herzegovina, returning to politics from Turkey at that point and recognizing that if one of one of the provisions of this uh, of this package, which was to make the presidency indirectly elected from within the parliament, uh, he wouldn't have a chance of becoming president. Uh, so his party, which had been very supportive of the package, flipped. In the end, it failed by two votes. You need a two-third majority. Yeah, there's 42 seats in the House of Representatives. They got 26 out of out of the 28 votes they needed. So it failed. Um, Almost immediately thereafter, there started to be dis discussion from, from Milorad Dodik and Republika Srpska, because Montenegro had its independence referendum that May, that we, we could think about having a referendum on something unspecified, but uh, the obvious implication and certainly the way it was perceived by all Bosnians was independence. So this has been a constant narrative on and off, modulated for four years, uh, whither the RS. So that in 2006, by the end of that campaign, you had a, a very, very different political environment than you had had a year before. Uh, and the international community was, had, had, had really had stepped back and was allowing things to be said and done that had not been allowed for over 10 years, or certainly eight since the, since the introduction of the bond powers. So. Um, at that point, we, we really started to accelerate in the downward spiral. But at the end of 2006, despite it being the worst year since 1997 in Bosnia, uh, there was an EU decision to reduce the size of the EU military presence in Bosnia. Uh, at that point, it had been <coughs> roughly 7,000 troops, U4. Uh, the official version was things have gotten so much better in Bosnia that we could, we could, we could afford to reduce it down to 2,000. Uh, it became an all Sarajevo-based force in an operational sense. Uh, what you had is what they call uh, liaison observation teams, lot houses, uh, which are for community relations, supposedly for intelligence gathering, though they're not staffed with intelligence officers. These are line infantry people. Uh, in an operational sense, they'd actually be a liability if anything happened, because you'd have to use forces to evacuate them. Um, so the official version was that this, this was because things had improved. Uh, what it did is it put the, the U4 in a reactive capacity. Now, the EU took on NATO's role as being the military arm for Dayton enforcement. This is a, a, a responsibility that follows from the Dayton Agreement Annex 1A. Uh, there are two executive capacities uh, that the international community has in Bosnia-Herzegovina. One is the high representative who's the final authority in theater on the interpretation and, and, and application of the Dayton Agreement, and the other is U4 now, which is, which is to maintain a safe and secure environment and has a UN Chapter 7 mandate. Um, both of these became moribund, not because they were no longer accepted by the parties. That's what you hear now. They became moribund because there wasn't the will on the international side of the equation to continue to use them, so they became atrophied. The legal basis for their operation is just as valid as it was when, when it started, but the political will to employ them is gone. So what you effectively have now is, is a rules-free environment in Bosnia. There's a sense that there is no 
leash. There is the, the guardrails that have kept Dayton, Bosnia from, from, from going astray and leading back into something ugly uh, have been allowed to, to fall off. They're still legally there. They could be put back, but they're not, they're not applied. Um, on top of this, since, since the, main, the main focus of the international community in Bosnia had been the Euro, European, Euro-Atlantic integration of Bosnia-Herzegovina, the enlargement approach that the European Union has had, which has been hitherto extremely successful, is the mentality with which the Brussels and most member states uh, look at Bosnia-Herzegovina. Well, that comes with certain attendant assumptions. One is that you're on the other side of the table of uh, a legitimate political inter democratic political interlocutor that wants to do the heavy lifting to join your club. Uh, I think what we've seen over the past three years that that's not the way Bosnian politic work, politics works, not because Bosnian politicians are uniquely nefarious, but the incentives in the Dayton system mean they don't have to operate according to that. They don't have to, have to give a damn what their citizens think because they have two levers that they apply pretty, pretty successfully. Patronage and fear. Uh, fear is a lot more salient than it was in the 2006 election because there, there is a perception that the rules that the international community had applied are no longer applicable. We're not, no longer going to be employed. Patronage may be a little less than 2006 because there's less money to throw around. In 2006, the value-added tax revenues had started to come in, and it was it was a it was playtime. This is when 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 politicians started to try to buy off various constituencies with what they thought was free money. Now they have to pay for it uh, with veterans organizations protesting against means testing and so forth. But uh, the bottom line is that the enlargement model uh, is not a full basket of foreign policy tools. It's a very limited set of tools. And the European Union is approaching Bosnia-Herzegovina only through the framework of the enlargement model and not with, with other foreign policy instruments. Um, what you've also seen is the, the, the throttling back of American engagement in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Uh, it's been episodic, but they're, they're the, the only country recently that you could say has consistent uh, engagement uh, consistent and, and, and focused and strategic engagement in the region is Turkey, of any of the members of, of the Peace Implementation Council. So uh, we've, we've got a, a 2010 election campaign where rhetorically we're, we're, there, there is essentially nothing you can't say. Um, and, and just yesterday, Milorad Dodik had said, you know, we'll, We'll hold a referendum on RS's status whenever I decide it's appropriate. Um, now, uh, there had been an attempt late last year, almost exactly a year ago, uh, in what was called the boot mirror process uh, to, to engage Bosnian political leaders in meeting the standards for closing the office of the high representative this is the so-called five plus two, five objectives, two conditions. Um, this is sort of, they were a distillation of the, the OHR's to-do list, if you will. Uh, and it includes resolution on state property issues, defense property, uh, rule of law, fiscal sustainability, and, and matters regarding the Birchko district. Um, the second condition is sort of the elastic clause catch-all, which is uh, we in the PIC need to be convinced that things are stable before we change the nature of our engagement. What, you're, what, what one can perceive now from Sarajevo and, and, and from Brussels and probably from all the capitals is that many, many PIC members feel stuck by this. They, don't want, they feel like they're trapped in a box that 5 plus 2 is not going to be not going to be met anytime soon, but we want to change the nature of the engagement. We want to reinforce the EU presence. We want to get away from having any executive responsibility. Uh, how do we do that? So there are various thoughts and scenarios on how, how, how this can be approached, and, and I don't think there's any consensus on it yet. One would be so-called decoupling, and <coughs> decoupling itself 
can mean different things to different people, but that would be essentially to remove the double hatting and have all the EU presence uh, concentrated in the EU delegation and have a residual high representative. Um, some would say keep put this representative outside Bosnia, but then you run into a legal problem, which I'm sure some of the people proposing it are well aware of, which is the high representative is the final authority in theater. If you take him out outside the theater, then he's not the final authority on the implementation of the Dayton Agreement. Uh, so that is very unlikely to get a lot of support uh, from the Americans, uh, Turks, Britain, um, perhaps even the Netherlands. Um, another, another is to keep on keeping on, which bureaucratically is probably the, the most logical or likely, rather, uh, scenario, but it's, it's a constantly declining <coughs> orbit. Um, I think that there are two, two ways, two, two factors that need to be looked at in Syria uh, in terms of how we get out of the situation we're in. One is restoring some semblance of stability. And once, once that's been done, then <laughs> trying to find uh, a, a, a popularly legitimate uh, and, and functional system for Bosnia-Herzegovina. Uh, which What we've been seeing ever since Dayton are two competing imperatives. I mean, ever, every, from the very minute American troops and NATO troops hit the ground, first they were only going to be there a year, and that was, that was President Clinton who had insisted on that. Uh, uh, the idea was once the September 1996 elections had happened, we 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 we'd accomplished things. You know, the joke at the time was the OSC was the organization to secure Clinton's election. Uh, the um, and so we've been constantly looking at our watches, saying, "Are we done yet?" Uh, which, of course, sends the message to everybody with an unfulfilled agenda on the ground that you don't have to really move. Uh, because ultimately, <laughs> bless you, bless you, uh, ultim ultimately uh, the international community will, will step back and you could, you could, you could do your thing. Um, and you have the lot, there's also a logical impossibility of removing the Dayton enforcement mechanisms while maintaining a Dayton constitution. Um, what always should have been the logic is so long as there's a Dayton Constitution, you're going to have you're going to have to have a Chapter 7 U4 and a, and a high representative. Uh, that would change the equation of all the people who need to agree to a different system. Uh, it would change the incentives that they have. Uh, so long as they as there's a perception that uh, from the Bosniak side, uh, the state might be able be allowed to fall apart and nobody will stop it. Or from the from the RS side, Republika Srpska side, that uh, constitutional reform is something that's going to be rammed down our throats. Uh, uh, you're going to have that problem. What could be done, and I, I, theoretically, it could still be done before the elections. I don't have any illusions that it will. But um, had the broader international community, but in particular the United States, European Union, and Turkey made clear before the elections that so long as Dayton, Dayton exists, the Dayton enforcement mechanisms are going to exist, and we don't have a timeline. So you know, the, if, you, if, you, if you're a Dayton fundamentalist, as you hear a lot in the RS now, which is interesting, because after the war, Dayton was a word they'd spit out with absolute venom. Uh, but now they recognize it as the high watermark of the sort of, sort of powers that, the, that they can have. Uh, if you, if you love Dayton, you better learn to love the high rep and love, love you for. Um, and make clear to each, each group that, you know, Bosniaks were not going to allow the country to fall apart. Serbs, yes, constitutional reform needs to happen to have a functioning state, but you have to be part of the deal. It's a given. You're not giving anything away by saying that, but it, it, would, it would bear repeating. Uh, Bosnia and Croats are very frustrated with the current state model. And you have now a European Court of Human Rights judgment that the Bosnian Constitution is out of whack with the European Convention on Human Rights because you, uh, certain citizens, if they don't declare themselves to be Bosniak, Croat, or Serb, can't become be represented on the presidency or in the House of Peoples. Uh, unfortunately, uh, 
the downside or flip side of that is that the, the, that has been interpreted by many European and broader governments uh, to, to be the meaning of constitutional reform. Well, while you may have a more uh, human rights reflective constitution with, with those provisions removed, it has nothing to do with functionality. And that's the key. Uh, if you have a system that insulates power brokers from having to feel responsible to their citizens, which you do, you have effectively an oligarchic system masqueraded, masquerading as a democratic system. We all pretend it's democracy. But it's really an oligarchy with three stovepipe separate political universes. Uh, you don't have to seek votes outside those boxes. So you're obviously you have a natural gravitational pull to be the, mo the more extreme protector of Serbs, Bosniaks, Croats. You're seeing this at play in the electoral campaign. If voters were convinced that no matter, you know, their vote is important, but no matter what happens, things won't be allowed to fall apart. <coughs> you're not solving the problem, you're, but you're creating a context in which the problem is more likely to be solved. Uh, you're not going to be able to solve the problem without a restabilization. Then, if people felt secure before the elections, they'd be more likely to vote in what they perceived to be their rational self-interest, rather than out of fear. Because quite often, when you, it's a schizophrenic experience when voters go into, into polling booths in Bosnia. Uh, they, they might be much more convinced of, of the, the rhetoric of, of one party <coughs> over another, but they fear well, they're going to vote for their potential ethnic cleanser, so I'll vote for my crook, even though I know he's a crook. You can't shock Bosnians with corruption. It doesn't, it doesn't mean they're not ticked off about it, but they assume that's why people get into politics in the first place. And for the most part, they're right. They have plentiful examples to point to that the, the one thing that the Bosnian political elites have in common is that they want to keep what they stole, they want to remain positioned to keep stealing, and they want to remain unaccountable. And while Dayton is not anybody's ideal uh, in that regard, it's second best for everybody who has a vested interest in the system. Uh, and if these are going to be our partners, because of course enlargement relies on partnership with the, with the, the, the wannabe member state, then you're not going to get a solution. Because there's, there's nothing in it for them to change the, those incentives. It's not because they're stupid, it's because they've got a good deal. And so if that, if people were convinced of that before the elections, you might get reshuffle the deck in such a way that you might have a better hand to play with to deal with the fundamental question of how you reorganize the state to make it work and make each self-defined group in the country feel vested in that system. I'm not saying that's an easy engineering problem. It's not. Uh, but I do think it's possible. And I don't think it's avoidable uh, if we want to get to something that works. Um, I'll give an example of something the EU could have been doing during this election campaign uh, as a public service that would be a lot more effective than the way it's gone about it. There is an EU communication strategy that's been employed in Bosnia uh, for the past few months. But in effect, the bottom line, you know, sort of bumper sticker message is the EU is good for you, trust us. Yeah, I mean, you're not, you're not going to convince anybody with a message like that. If there were, however, a message going out saying, the, this is the money that your politicians left on the table because they don't want to meet the conditions they declare they want to to join the EU. Uh, and this is how, it, how much it costs you in you know, euro and cent terms. And I'll give you a concrete example. Uh, one of the things that the European Union wants is a ministry of agriculture at the state level for the common agricultural policy. Uh, the SAA is a free trade agreement. Bosnia should be able to export its agricultural goods to, to Europe, the European Union. It can't. Why? It doesn't have this ministry. It doesn't have all the things that, that you need to do for food safety concentrated. Who does this hurt the most? I mean, it hurts Bosnian farmers in general the most, but, but let's, let's get even more specific. It hurts, hurts Serb farmers in the Kraina the most because first of all, they're the closest to the EU markets in, in Hungary, Slovenia, Austria, and they have the best, it's the flattest farmland. It's, you could farm at scale there. 
if somebody said, okay, Jovan Seljak, you know, John Farmer, essentially, this is how much you're, you lost whatever. Your average size farm is X, your average basket of produce is Y. This is how much money out of your pocket this decision costs you on average a year. We're not telling you who, and these are the people who don't want you to have it. We're not telling you how to vote. We're just giving you the facts. Do that issue by issue, sector by sector. Nobody in political power would come away unscathed because they're all at it. They're all protecting some fiefdom. Spell it out. First of all, it would show, show citizens that the EU actually cares about them as people rather than just their leaders as interlocutors, which they remain unconvinced of. And it would, it would, it would be real voter information. That was a lost opportunity. And that's something the commission could do on the back of an envelope in about 20 minutes. I'm sure they have the data at their fingertips. They just don't want to do it. We don't want to get involved. So finally, on, on once you get the lid on and you have the election uh, and you come out the other side, you still have to deal with the constitutional question. There's no way around it. Uh, and the way, I think part of the way you, or bless you, you arrive at a solution is to try to broaden the equation. Right now there's an assumption because it's worked this way in other you know, EU, EU applicant countries to deal with political elites and say, oh, well, ultimately they'll, they're accountable to their citizens so we only have to talk to them, it's one-stop shopping. Uh, citizens don't have any delusions their politicians actually care what they think. They still vote because they figure that they, they, you know, it could be worse if they don't. Uh, but they, they don't have any illusions that these people have their interests in mind. Uh, broaden the discussion. Uh, go to the citizenry. Make clear that, yes, we're not going to impose anything from without, nor should we. Uh, it wouldn't be possible and it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be durable. Whatever is going to work is going to have to be an organic Bosnian solution. But we in the international community can facilitate that. First, by saying this is the context. You, you know, we're not going to allow things to fall apart. And second, by actively engaging in the discussion and trying to, you know, if you think of this as three levels, you've got the international level, you've got the domestic political level, and then you have the citizenry. The only way you're going to get forward movement is to squeeze from both sides. Constituency build for Europe, constituency build for a functioning state. Uh, this requires political skills. It's not a technical question. And that's why whoever is chosen to be the new EU delegation head damn well better be a politician and not a bureaucrat. Uh, this is not a job for diplomats. No offense to diplomats, but I mean, it's a different set of skills than most diplomats have. Uh, it's not just a question of reporting and representing. It's a question of, of activity. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. Um, one final point, and it'll come up in the Q&A, on the Mladic question, which is why I'm, I'm speaking to Parliament tomorrow. Uh, there will be a very important vote coming up on Serbia's Stabilization and Association Agreement with the EU. Now that there has been this climb down uh, by Serbia at the UN General Assembly on the Kosovo question, there is, there is a very pronounced desire on the number of EU, part of the number of EU member states to reward Serbia for, for, for Picking a fight and then backing away from it at a strategic moment. Uh, you, could, you could question what sort of incentives that sets up uh, in, 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 in the region and what message it sends about conditionality. But there's one condition that Serbia hasn't met for 15 years, which is full cooperation on, with the ICTY. Uh, Ratko Mladic, the architect of the Srebrenica massacre in July 1995, is, is presumed by anybody who's, who's investigating to be in Serbia. There's no reason to believe he's anywhere else. Uh, there are numerous reasons to believe that Serbia at various stages in, in, in its post-democratic transition has been less than completely forthright about knowing where he is. You've had the situation, oh, well, we, it comes to light that he was there at a certain point when the government was denying it, and then they'd say, oh, well, he was there then, but we certainly isn't here now. Um, I think this is, this is a simple political physics equation. Politicians are the same everywhere. They're not, going to, they're not going to take a political hit if they're going to get what they want for free. Uh, and, and had the European Union aligned itself behind the Dutch position, which was ultimately withdrawn in, in, in June, that until, until Mladic is handed over, 
there won't be there won't be ratification of the stabilization and association agreement. He'd be in the Hague now. I don't have any doubt about that. It was at a crunch point two years ago when Radovan Karadzic was miraculously found and handed over to 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 the Hague for trial. Um, but when the message is there's only one of the 27 that's piping up and ultimately you could get them to back off, uh, nobody, why, why should Tadic cooperate if he, if he could avoid it? So I, I think it's very important that parliamentarians uh, not let their governments, you know, because ICTI cooperation across the board has been, uh, the, the policies have been driven by parliaments, not by executives, even the United States, had it not been for a bipartisan congressional effort to force certification of Serbia's cooperation with the ICTY, it wouldn't have happened. So I hope that the parliamentarians I speak to tomorrow recognize their, 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 the potential of their votes and, uh, and their, their responsibility uh, in the interests of justice and in the interests of EU credibility. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Tony. I'm sorry I went over time. No, not at all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.